just keep playing. Yeah. You gotta be kidding me. A dozen milkmen? Isn't that a little unusual? Twelve milkmen is theoretically possible. Yeah. Yeah. Thirteen is silly. silly. Oh. Looks like one milkman too many, Coogan. <laughs> Freaks! Find them! Hello, ladies and gentlemen. How are you all doing today? My name is Clark. I am your super duper duper awesome sailor in this spaceship we call two guys and some horror joined with the commander supreme admiral mr curtis miller himself curtis how are you doing today holy shit that's way too strong of an open for me um i appreciate it <laughs> whoa i appreciate it uh every single word of it i'm doing good today i'm doing good uh always love popping in and, and doing this with you each and every week so it's it's one of my highlights, man. It's one of the things I look forward to every week is is hanging out with you and talking about a horror film, whether it's shitty or whether it's great. It's just it's a highlight. So I love doing this. Yeah, man. I think sometimes like there's there's like high emotions behind like the energy we have behind doing an episode. It's like I like this because and I really want you to see it, and then kind of get the excitement of kind of forcing someone else to watch through it and kind of have them gauge it and be like understanding that hey this is something this guy likes and we kind of like similar things and i am just like really eager to hear like your opinions and your thoughts on it as we kind of go through here because man this film freaked uh it was made in 1993 or it came out in 1993 and it was kind of uh Alex Winters and uh, kind of he got a little successful after Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, and he got a TV show from MTV basically, where him and a couple friends like made a bunch of sketch comedy, and it was very nineteen early nineteen nineties, like coming out of the uh, the eighties into the nineties, and uh, he wound up getting a lot of money from these executive people like, just to make a movie. And he made it however he wants. And his budget was was friggin' massive, dude. Uh, all the special effects, everything, like the claymation, there were some animated sequences, the transformations, there was animatronics. Uh, there was, like, animation in certain parts, like the very beginning, the intro. Uh, just different types. And some of, like, this animation is very, like, expensive to make. So I have no idea how this film happened at all. They got Mr. T, who at the time was, like, a like a big icon, a big star, Brooke Shields, same thing. Uh, and like just a bunch of like kind of familiar B actors here and there, as well as Randy Quaid. Well, one of the most Matt. famous voices of like eighties and nineties as well. And Bobcat, I mean, that voice of Sockhead is so, I don't know. I've heard it in almost oh, yeah. every popular movie you can think of from the eighties or nineties. <laughs> It's and it's it's so iconic, right? I mean, that's one of the cool things about uh, the the gentleman who plays even the Eternal Flame. Um, he's in everything. I mean, I I can't stop looking. He even did Idiot Box that first episode that you sent me to check it out. Um, he's he's in that episode, and then you have Firefart guy. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's the guy with the aspirin. That's my favorite. He's like, yeah, we'll talk about that. Yeah, keep going. But no, I just, I mean, I think um, this cast is just a knockout. It, it's insane how they got everybody together. The budget makes sense um, for what <laughs> for what they came up with. And I mean, I just, I don't know. Do you want to hear my initial thoughts on it before we get too too deep dive into it? Or, or do you want to just start cracking it open? Yeah, just tell me right now. So, I mean, after, so I watched it last week for the first time when, when you and I were discussing how hard this is to find. And this is, I think, the third week in a row where we just had a really hard time finding the movie um, anywhere to stream. Um, even buying this is is almost impossible, which we can talk more about later if we want or whatever. But uh, So I, 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 find, I watched it last week, and then I watched it again today. Uh, yeah, that's where we ended up watching it was on, on YouTube. YouTube. Uh, it's not being taken down. There are ads on it. It's been out for years now, like a couple of years it's been on YouTube. So if anyone owns the right, they're not throwing out copyright strikes. This guy's yep. making money. So there's no distribution going on. It's like super expensive to actually find a Blu-ray copy of this film, a film in like in higher quality. I'm sure you could find like a dump if you want to do it illegally, but don't recommend that. Uh, just you watch it on YouTube. Uh, and there, there's kind of low lower quality in that that kind of way which is you know 
disappointing, Curtis, because I'd like to buy this movie. Uh, if not the digital streaming version, like I'll I'll settle for a Blu-ray. But yeah, if we could get Shop much. Factory or um, someone in that kind of business where that's that's their whole goal is to just be able to uh, pay the amount of money it costs to get the rights to be able to do a re-release of something on Blu-ray or even just DVDs. That's that's their main goal. They just want to get it in our hands as consumers who love physical media. Because I love to stream stuff, but at the same time, I love having a copy of the film in case I ever, you know, want to go over to a friend's house. I don't want to have to think, oh, well, can we stream it? Can we not? You know, that kind of a thing. Like, there's something yeah. nice about having the physical media along with the ability <laughs> to stream it if I want to. Um, yeah. But anyway, so I was watching it again today, just prepping before we, we record the episode. And, um, like, I just started thinking in my head about just all the crazy antics of alex winter and tom stern when it comes from cat goldthwaite the the idiot box Sock, Sock from, from the show um the amazing effects done by screaming matt george who is just a huge icon in horror and in uh effects in general and then you get the knockout yep. cast from the 90s and you get the hilariousness of a black comedy mixed with a science fiction mixed with a body horror film and it was all done in 1993 and i think it was just right. too big for its britches in 1993 like there's something about something to be said about timing and getting it just right and i think they were ahead of the game when it came to what they it, did sadly yeah 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 so it, it wasn't marketed very well either so it, it it was marketed like this saw a very limited release in theaters though i actually think it may not have even had that it may have gone straight straight to vhs they did have uh, a limited release in theater um yeah but it was primarily i think the two biggest places was australia and japan i read which was weird right. to me and then even a smaller release in theater in the u.s well, it had a budget of about eleven million dollars in the nineties. That's not a small budget at all. That's no. that's a big movie that's budget. That's huge, yeah. And it had uh their opening weekend here in the United States is like seven thousand dollars. So I'm I'm pretty sure they just didn't release it like super big, just enough to kind of get it out there, get the VHS discs out or whatever, tapes out. And man, the first time I saw this film was on was on late night cable like if you remember those days where you go on like 4 a.m you can find this movie you've never heard of or nobody's ever talked of before and this was on this was playing and i was like i had no idea the fuck this fucking existed i love mr t like i was i was like a huge mr t fan back in the day and i saw this as like a 14 year old and i was like holy shit that's fucking awesome late night tv was the best because you could literally yeah. just put any channel on late at night and you'll come across something interesting to watch whether it was good or bad doesn't yeah. matter right everyone has their own taste but it was something interesting enough at 3 a.m 4 a.m that you're just like yeah i'm gonna watch this and i don't care i mean now you can get that from netflix or just having like a, one of the streaming tv providers that just stream television all day long but yeah no i completely agree um kind of jumping into this a little bit more like that like you said special effects this film alone were super massive uh like cost a lot of money i want to talk about kind of the claymation at the very uh, beginning of the film there's the claymation sequence where you see the faces of the actors and curtis do you know how that's done stop animation no well kind of kind of so this guy actually paints these loaves of kind of clay and uh they're they're colored and everything and he, he just changes them individually he'll take a cut a layer off deform it a little bit you know slice it up get the next one in and he'll just kind of animate everything meticulously similar to to stop stock on anima animation but it's like claymation uh in a sense that everything's painted and sliced and the amount of time he put and effort he puts into doing those animations is crazy yeah um, that's that's insane claymation i mean you could go on a long, long laundry list of different claymation films that were amazing, but I have to say this is definitely one of the better ones I've seen in a long time. Well, Clay, Alex, or sorry, Alex, Winters had tended to work with people he had in the past. Like, he'd make friends and he'd keep them around him, kind of similar to Adam Sandler with today. But for this film especially, like, he got Keanu Reeves, he got that animator, he got another animator, like, two claymators that he had worked with before some connection 
and got all the this awesome stuff together to build this kind of movie out and you were kind of you kind of went in what you you felt this movie was a little bit earlier you kind of mixed it with like the science fiction and all that to me this feels like the 1990s and a little bit more than that it it puts a lot of nods to like 1940s comic books kind of the hero lifting his face up kissing the girl at the end uh kind of the way you know their faces look off in the distance and they say is it over if it's not I'll see to it. Or it's just like some, some corny line like that when they look off into the distance and mm-hmm. they really nailed kind of like mixing that in with like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles uh, and a little bit of horror at the same time, like intermingling, like leave it to be there, beaver and like, yeah, the Ninja Turtles, I guess that's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they definitely, they knew what they were doing in the nineties. Um, and I mean, that's the cool thing about Alex Winter and Tom Stern is they're such good friends from college days that, this is just, you know, like we always talk about, passion projects tend to always be a lot more fun than, um, you know, hard-nosed, uh, super theater art type films, right? Though those can also be super amusing and appealing, uh, it's at a different, it's a different level. Like, this movie is nonstop fun, beginning to end, total black comedy all throughout, I, I mean, the dark humor in it is is just, it's so good. And it, it doesn't ever make you feel um, like you shouldn't laugh, right? It's not like they're walking around making fun of certain types of people or, um, I don't know, picking on certain types of, of illnesses or something like that, which a lot of other films do. Um, this is just taking things from that time and basically making jokes about it or even just making jokes about their current situation that the character might be going through, which to me is just, it's, you can, you can actually like agree with what's being said and not feel like a piece of shit. (laughs) Yeah, no, I, I agree. This movie's kind of fun. A lot of, a lot of nineties pop culture references too. things that a lot of people just wouldn't get. Uh, so uh, I guess we can kind of get into it a little bit more here. Let's but do it. I agree it. with you, man. Like, I really love this film. It, it's one of my, I don't know, I have, it has a place in my heart. It's one of my heart heart movies. And honestly, it's fucking amazing. This The film starts out like there's Brooks Shields with uh, what Ricky Coogan, I believe his name is. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, who is Alex Winter's uh, character. And uh, they're they're in an interview, and you can kind of see like the freaked version of Ricky Coogan moving his head around and talking to her, and the lights off. So you just kind of see, uh, like she's talking to him, and they they're really building it up like he's still transformed for the end. Like to me, like this is this is fantastic. This is absolutely brilliant. We want the audience to think that this guy's a monster throughout the entirety of this film up to this point. So like he does not get cured. Great. Great kind of foreshadowing there. Uh, it sends you down a path of not trusting the fucking directors at, afterwards, but whatever. Great job by kind of doing the underhanded technique and turning our heads away and having us believe something else. Super well done. Uh, I felt like the... Because the first time I watched it, not knowing what the end is is like, I was thinking that it was more of the silhouette of like, we're not going to show his face because, you know, we want to protect his uh, rights or whatever. You know, like whenever they bring on people who want to remain anonymous, but it was at the same time as like, yeah, but you just told us who he is. So what are we trying to hide? (laughs) He just said his face makes kids scream and like... Just the mention of his name, Ricky Ricky Coogan. Yeah. He's terrified of him and grossed out by him. That whole entire scene of his ends up being like, yeah, you're a disgusting monster. Tell us how it happened. And then he begins his story. And dude, I, I fucking love the beginning scene because he's making the deal with like these suits about whether or not he's going to really be the, the, the face of their super toxic chemical that is being used to transform people into monsters. The face of EES. Uh, Everything except yeah, shoes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. Put a pin on that. Everything except shoes. E E S. So they're like, can you go to this country called Santa Flan, which is it's named after a creamy, delicious dessert. Uh 
and they offer him like a set of money, like four million dollars or something like that. And then he's about they're about to offer him more. And like he's looking at his guys and you just see them shaking their head. And you can tell like dubbed over, Mm-mm, don't do it or kind of just like going around. And then he looks at him and he just like goes, I'm going to do it. So like, everything in this, everything in this build up, though, right? Every, everything the, the, the is a joke. The shrinking guy, too. Yeah, everything is a joke, and that I think that's what makes this film so much more fun. Also, is that uh, they're not taking this too seriously. Like they understand what they're making, and that's gold. Like if you can, if you can do that and do it well, you're gonna have a lot more fun. Because when he's sitting there and he's like, you know, he first of all he looks like this drug lord in the in the suits that he in that he's in. You know, it reminded me of a scene from Scarface. I don't know why. I don't know if it was just the the way everyone was sitting together or whatever, but he looked like some kind of a drug lord just sitting there and you know, he's looking at his buddies and you're right, like they're all like mm 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 and and that's when the guy's got the giant uh printed out PowerPoint slides basically and he's like, We are offering you two million and then, you know, they're saying, No, no, no and then they slide it away and then four million <laughs> It's like, God, this is freaking gold, man, like every joke that they're telling they just knock it out of the park and it's not like they're beating you over the head with it either like that uh shitty movie we watched not too long ago where the joke just kept coming back the mole moving around the face right it's like right. there there's a different level of it and and alex winter and the team they hit it perfectly i think especially in that intro no i i think this movie is so intelligently done i think alex winter is probably i don't know i think he's brilliant i think he should have acted a bit more I'm kind of depressed that he didn't get more work because and and had his creative mind used a little bit more. And now he's directed recently, but he hasn't acted since uh, like for the, for many years until Bill and Ted, man. Which, by the way, fucking loved. Talk we'll, about that. Later. We'll get there. We'll Hang get there. That. <laughs> uh, anyhow, the the portion of the like a little bit beforehand backtracking because I know I missed it, but there are a lot of gags in this film, like. Almost everything's in this in this film is a gag, and I've missed so many things, or I maybe just didn't they didn't stand out to me. And then I see something new every single time I see this flick. Um, the very beginning, the guy there's a scientist brought in, and he just continuously shrinks until they bring out like, I think he was one of the smallest men who ever lived, in the original suit, and just man. Yeah, it was four different. It was four different guys that. Uh played George Ramirez, right? So as as he's trying to explain... Michu. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So Mihaly Michu Mizraros is the, the final uh, version of George Ramirez. And it, even that was just a joke within a joke. Because when he comes out, William Sadler calls him like a completely different name. He's like, this is, Hor- or, this is uh, Juan Ramos. And then the guy comes out and he's like, my name is Jorge Ramirez. And then <laughs> you could just see William Sadler, like, whatever, like, waving it off, like, I don't care who you are. You're just here to say some bit. And then so as the gentleman is is talking about how he's worked with um, Zygot 24 or whatever it's called. Um, he starts Zy- calling yeah. the, uh, he starts everybody. Shrinking. He's like, I'm telling you, everybody who thinks this is bad for them is a fucking idiot. And yeah, throughout that process, he's, like, freaked out about protesters calling them idiots and just steam's coming out of him and you just see like every flash back to him you you see the shorter actor until it gets down to meet you yep um yeah nah super well done a lot of fun with that (laughs) oddly enough oddly enough uh meet you's in waxwork which we'll get to eventually on the show he's in a lot of films yeah Mm. very very prolific career as one of those uh, smaller men. He was about two foot, two foot nine. Uh, like I think he was from like Budapest or something. I don't, I don't remember. I looked this up like a little while ago. I think he was in the Alf costume. Yeah, he's Alf. <laughs> yeah, I think that was that's what I remember him from. Uh, yeah, no, he he, uh, great great fun. He he came back in later. Deep Roy actually. Uh, you know that scene where uh, I guess we could talk a little bit later, but. The third guy who he turns into right before Michu it also makes another cameo in the film, but kind of as a stunt double instead. And we could talk about that. Okay. Um, no, this film, Meg- Morgan Fairchild is a stewardess. And when Ricky Coogan and her, his friend are going there, they're like, 
uh, is that your troll up there? And they say the name of this redheaded kid who's kind of supposed to look like a leave it to beaver, adorable, you know, dorky kid. Uh, he has these massive, huge ears, red hair, and everybody just calls him a troll. Stewie Gluck. Stewie. Stewie Gluck. Yeah. Great. Uh, this kid's just like flying around and annoying him everywhere. They become, uh, he becomes, they become spirit, uh, spirit bonded as what, what is the world word? Soul, uh, soul mate. Soul mate. <laughs> yeah. Which is a term I usually would use for, uh, your, you know, your long lost lover or, you know, your significant other. Yeah. Like I call my wife, my soul mate. I, I don't really think I would ever call another human being my soulmate, but for the purposes of the film, it it makes perfect sense. They need hey. they need that uh connection, that Curtis, bond. You're my soul podcast mate. Perfect. See how you put podcast <laughs> though in front of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if I uh, I don't know, man. I I like you, but I don't. I'm not ready to make the commitment to call you my soulmate. Uh, no, not just we yet. can kind of. We'll talk about that later. Maybe okay. we'll do that offline, not not, not in now. front of everybody. Not now. Let's not make this awkward. No, I was kidding. Not now, uh, Jin Yang. Make it awkward for everyone, okay? We, uh, I really loved that they had Brooke Shields in this film, and then they like brought up her Academy Award winning film, and she's like, oh, I heard that movie sucks. <laughs> <laughs> it's like all of these fucking 90s references. It's all you're getting from this film at all. And then <sighs> Mr. T shows up. You hear, uh, what? what's the guy's name again? Bobcat Goldwaite's voice was Sock, Sockhead or, yeah, I think that's his name, Sockhead. I yeah, know, Sockhead but... is two different people, which was kind of funny. Yeah. You, you had the person wanna... who played the physical Sockhead. Well, but the then voice you had the most important one. Yeah, and then you had Bobcat who actually played the voice, which was I didn't realize it would I take two people. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Anyhow, uh, regardless of what happened, they they show up at this freak freak show and they get turned into freaks and kind of in the freak transformation where two of the characters get merged together with this kind of annoying radical uh protester girl like super into doing the right thing because she's obno and she's obnoxious about it. And then you have the kind of the horn dog best friend who is very uh sexist, misogynistic and can't kinda... stop talking about his Rodney. Yeah, his Rodney. He talks about his wiener, he puts a hand in his crotch. Uh and he tells people you started out as a pimple. Very important. Uh he merges with the feminist uh insane protester who's obnoxious about it. And they make a yin and yang thing. But during the process where they're merging, like they turn into Gumby jerking off and Pokey. <laughs> like they're just turning into like a bunch of a bunch of random shit through this claymation animation. And it's like one of my favorite scenes in movies. Did you did you pick up the reference to the old Sinbad movie? Kinda. Yeah, so one of the claymations was like the Cyclops Eye, which I guess is right, like right, a right. 1950s uh Sinbad movie and they they use claymation in that as well so that's kind of neat um but yeah I guess the guy who did the effects was he's like world famous super famous I don't know who he is I haven't I haven't read his name before but it's very interesting the Gumby one had me rolling though like I couldn't stop laughing when I saw it I hey, put that it. away and Gumby just yeah. flips him off Elijah just... oh my god Randy Quaid fucking destroyed that part he did so yeah. good I agree Oh man, like that transformation sequence though. Keep that if you want to watch. If you're not, if you're not, if you haven't seen this film, just watch the transformation sequence, and that'll. That's basically the entirety of the film. Totally worth that it. That is yeah. the type of humor. If you like that, feel free to watch the entire movie because it's just like that. Uh, it's an artsy farty. We had fun with this, and we made something we enjoy type film, uh, and kind of moving, and we meet the rest of the freaks. Uh, Curtis, before I kind of, we do, I don't really want to do a roll call right away. So I kind of want to talk to you about who your favorite freak was, who your can favorite I, character was. Can I flip it and, and ask you, who do you think my favorite freak was? I don't know, man. 
I don't know if you're going to do like the one that you think is the coolest looking or if you're going to do the one that you like most as a character, but it's definitely not nosy because he's an asshole and he's kind of fucking lame, <laughs> but hmm, I don't think it's the farting guy. I don't think it's the pinhead girl. Is it Stewie Watts? Stewie, who's that? Stewie Gluck, sorry. The kid, the redhead kid? Yeah. No. Nah. It's Cowboy. I, mean, he becomes... I like Cowboy. Dude, I almost was going to say that. Yeah, I like Cowboy a lot. I think that that's I love Cowboy too. one of the more clever Let him in your freaks. Heart. Let him in your heart. Let yeah. him in your heart. <laughs> I think he's one of the more clever freaks with the idea literally yeah. mixing a cow and a boy, and it you know it's a cowboy. Um, but then also I think he has some of the best uh, plot moving along scenes in the movie he's the, uh he's the mentor he is he's he's the he's uh the senpai he's the spiritual <laughs> kind of guy yeah guy totally. in this film. i thought he was great i thought he i thought he had uh, a lot of really good good lines and just kept the movie going along at a good pace keanu reeves the uh ortiz the uh dog boy as well. now that's i mean if people don't know that that's a huge like that's that i mean i watched the movie once didn't realize it was keanu I, reeves i think he's uncredited in this film he is. If you scroll, like on IMDb, if you scroll all the way to the bottom, after clicking on the entire list of everyone, rest of cast listed alphabetically, uncredited, Keanu Reeves, Ortiz the Dog Boy. And he's he's a pretty big role in the Freaks, when you first meet the Freaks. Uh, he's right. also the leader of the pack, and he's the one, <laughs> no pun intended, um, and he he's the one coming up with the plan, right? The, the, the initial idea of getting out. Uh, and escaping the the freak show, which is I think amazing to think that Keanu Reeves and Alex Winter just continue to show how awesome their friendship is, um, and and have worked together on so many different things. Even though Keanu, you know, obviously went off and had a completely different style of career, um, they still, I mean, every time they're on screen together, it's just it's perfect chemistry. They play off each other so well. Yeah, uh, who's no, your favorite? For freaks. Oh, for a freak. who's my favorite freak? Yeah. Uh, I don't want to turn that back on you, but I think it's not Brooke Shields. Not Definitely Brooke not Shields. Brooke Shields. <laughs> I, I don't know, man. Like, I think they all looked pretty cool, um, especially with the main freak when Ricky Coogan turns into, he, he fully transforms because only half of him's not because, spoilers, they don't ha the guy doesn't have enough Zygrot 24 the chemical that transforms everyone is it 24 but yeah yeah i so he only gets half transformed but when he fully transforms that looked really cool versus the uh the other animatronic monster uh stewie glock yeah i really enjoyed the especially that fight scene the uh yeah. those two facing off was a lot of fun i think the aesthetic was a whole lot yeah no that fight was so fucking looney tunes but we can talk about that too uh this film is like Looney Tunes. Eye and Eye, the two Rasta eyeballs. Those two were pretty yes. cool. I really like the idea of Dude. them. <laughs> Dude, I fucking love them too. And the way he just dealt with them, he just picks up sand and throws it at them. I mean, it's so smart. Like, <laughs> it's, it's the fastest eyeballs. way. Yeah. Rasta fastest way to hang out. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny because their that names was... are literally I, and then the other one is N dot I. So it's I and I. Like, a private investigator type. I don't know. Like it's such a fun name, even like, oh man, geniuses when they wrote this. Right. Geniuses. I, they're all so bloodshot. <laughs> it's as if they're all stoned. And they come out of uh, the giant uh, Elijah head, which I, which I think is is awesome. Yeah, so the eyeballs in constant it. security, right? And the minute that they notice something weird's happening, they come rolling out, and then they have their little. Uh, you know, machine guns or whatever they've got. So good. No, um, I, I, before, I, before we get off this subject, because we're going to have to, this is the best way to kind of introduce this clip, the milkman saying, which hopefully everybody's kind of wondering the context of that clip, the very start, but everyone's dressed up as milkmen when the rest of our eyes get introduced. And it's fucking great because they, they meet up with each other and just super fucking awkward, very 19, 60s kind of uh, tongue-in-cheek comedy mixed with the the 90s kind of screw it look at how cool this is radical tubular 
just everything's intermingled. Great scene. Truly is. 12 Milkmen is theoretically possible. Pop tart now. I don't know. Let's kind of talk a little bit more about the film itself. And I don't know, I can gush over Ortiz the dog boy all day or a uh, cowboy or Mr. T as the bearded lady. Um, Curtis, I have one more question for you. Okay. Which is which transformation story moved you the most? <laughs> um, they're, they're all so good. Um, I mean, honestly, the, the best one is Bearded Lady. It's Mr. T, for sure. When he just, especially as they're showing it, and so he walks, so for the listeners uh, who may not have seen this movie yet, Mr. T is telling the story about how he became the Bearded Lady, right? Because technically he's a transformed freak. Um, but he showed up uh, one day at the freak show with a, and was talking with Elijah, and he's like, I just, I just don't know what to do with myself anymore. I'm, I'm so lost. I don't know what I want to do. And Elijah says to him, you'd probably be better without a penis. And then Mr. T. Punch him and he's like, but you can keep the beard. <laughs> but you can keep the beard. And then Mr. T's, you know, embracing him and so happy that Elijah uh, was going to transform him using Zygrot 24 into the bearded lady. And uh, yeah, I mean. I like who I am. I like me. I like me. I am. I am me. <laughs> it's Give funny me roll. because there's so much. I mean, do you know the drama around Mr. T and the filming? I know he didn't like the movie. So like, he, I know there was some some issues. So basically, um, Alex Winter in an interview um, at Alamo Draft House uh, after watching Freaked got up on stage. They did a big Q and A and. Um, one of the questions was like, how, how did everyone do with the cast? Was it a lot of fun working with everyone? And he said, everyone was great. The only, the only person who had any problem was Mr. T. And it was, he was, it was that he was done being, uh, he was done cross-dressing. So he felt like he, he just didn't want to do it anymore. He was a great sport all the way through the shoot, but about like a week before he was done filming, he had just had too much of having to do cross-dressing to do it. And um alex winter said he's a pretty macho guy and he was a really good sport until he just wasn't and then he just disappeared he didn't even fight with anybody he didn't talk to anyone he didn't tell anyone what he was doing or where he was going he just vanished he says um and it basically fell on alex winter to try and call him and convince him to come back and let him know that he wasn't done yet but they were unable to like mr t was just like listen when i was a baby my mama called me baby t and when i was a boy my mama called me boy t and when I was a man, my mama called me Mr. T, and she said, you need to stick up for yourself. So he was like, yeah, I'm done cross-dressing. I'm not coming back and filming it. So they had to use a scab in a couple of scenes in the back. Uh, if you watch it again, look for it, because I still haven't seen... I haven't been able to figure out what scene it is yet. But, uh, yeah. So most of the film is also done with ADR. Um, so none of, right. none of the spoken words are live. Uh, recorded with like boom mics or anything like that. It's all redone in the studio, ADR over, right. and they used Lee Ehrenberg to do um, Mr. T's voice because Lee did a really great Mr. T impression. So because Mr. T wouldn't come back, uh, they had to have somebody else do it, which is which is pretty cool to hear. Um, it sucks. Good to know, yeah, it sucks that Mr. T felt like he he couldn't couldn't finish uh, shooting. I mean, if you've only got a week left and you were already filming, say for three weeks. Um, I mean, do it in post. I would have loved you have just to swallow your pride and just finish that last week. You know, it would have been great. Kind of, kind of messed up at you, Mister T. Not we, gonna lie. We also don't really notice that he um, that he wasn't there for whatever scene it is. So I guess it kind of no. worked out in the end. <laughs> Shows up back at the end, you know, dressed as a man, and whatever happens, happens. Well, you don't know what order it was shot in. But, uh, um, man, that's something I'm tired don't of know. wearing a dress. I I think I've heard that, but I, I've definitely forgot it. I'm glad you brought it back up. Yeah, and I thought everyone, that was probably the most interesting thing I could find about the film. Yeah. No, I, I like this. Uh, Jeff Kahn as uh, Nosy. Uh, I didn't really notice Nosy the first time I watched this movie. Like, I just remember he was kind of there. He was just one of the freaks. He's forgettable. But after watching this, yeah, he's definitely forgettable. Nosy? nosy. I never liked he, Fuck I never you. Really like you. Apparently, Fuck we were supposed dick. to dislike Nosy. Just didn't get enough Nosy. Worm. 
Derek McGrath uh, would do anything to wipe his own ass. Really, really would be fine if you did it too. Uh, <laughs> the worm. Ugh. Sockhead, he's not much for stories. <laughs> Nail in the head girl, forgot her name, Rosie the Pinhead. Pinhead, yeah. Fun, yeah. <laughs> when he's the saying his plane. goodbyes to everybody, because yeah, because they basically in in the film um, Elijah tells uh, Coogan the entire plan, what they're going to do. He's gonna you know inject Coogan with more Zygrot twenty four than he's ever put in anyone, and turn him into uh, a hideous, disgusting monster to to kill all the other freaks and start over fresh. Is 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 his plan. And when Coogan tells all the freaks that, they sit down, and then he kind of, you know, has his goodbye moments with each and every single one of them. And that, and when he gets to Pinhead, to uh, to Rosie the Pinhead, that's basically what <laughs> I don't know. It's basically yeah. what he says to her. Cause and she cries she, because it's so beautiful what yeah. he says. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, you know what? Rosie is adorable, and when she goes back to being a human being, like, with hair and stuff, she's still gorgeous, so I'm sure she's gorgeous right now. Uh, Frogman also, by the way, it's better if he, if maybe it's just better if he dies because he's such a hideous freak. Frogman's just a French guy in a... Uh, in scuba oh gear. Gosh. <laughs> yeah, that's all he is. He's just a Frenchman in scuba gear. I can tell you what my favorite uh, favorite scene is at least in the film if you'd like to hear yeah. that so i I, I personally love the game show scenes i thought that was uh probably like the coolest oh, part yeah. when they put it all together they play uh, that's how they introduce all the freaks yeah they play hollywood squares initially and that's the introduction to each freak that we get there's and a then... joke and a reference to some guy who's always been on hollywood squares for like years with the, the skeleton joke but i just didn't get it didn't age very well yeah i think in the 90s i was so when this movie came out i was four years old in 93 and um i definitely didn't watch hollywood squares growing up my grandma didn't watch it i don't remember my parents really watching it but uh but yeah hey, the joke was there so that was good uh <laughs> but yeah then they play wheel of fortune later on which i think is uh more in tune to what uh, I would know growing up. Mm. And that was a lot of fun. Nosy. Uh, is there an X? No, there's no X. Oh, son of a bitch. I mean, you could tell that he's definitely supposed to be uh, the least liked person out of all the freaks. But yeah, even then, still pretty uh, forgettable. Would have liked him to be a little bit more unlikable. Nosy. I never liked you. Fuck you. Fair enough. Let's see. The Frogman, too. Very cool guy. Used his tongue a whole lot. We can talk about how they killed him. Oh, he's Toad. Like, used to yeah. Throw firecrackers at you. Yeah, the Toad. Sorry, not yeah. the Frogman. So I was like, hold on, wait. Throw... Frogman doesn't use his tongue? <laughs> no, no, no. You're right. Toad. Um,. Kind of just like your standard 90s black guy goes, oh shit, joke. When he takes, like, he catches the stick of dynamite or whatever it is and swallows it, he goes, oh shit. Boom, dead. I uh, kind of want to talk about what happens to Stewie Gluck as he, uh, he's, he, he, he's the, he's flying around in Ricky Coogan's head because they're soulmates and they're connected by ESP. Mm -hmm. um, Sockhead has ESPN, but all the other freaks have ESP. And this kid like goes, I'm going to tell everybody where that he where he's caught. And so he goes to several newspapers and people just throw him out the window uh, over and over again. You know who who's uh, played his stunt double? Curtis? Uh, no. I Deep don't. Roy. George Ramirez, number three, the uh, third stage before he becomes Michu. Nice. So this kid's just getting thrown out the window. There, there's nothing but slapstick comedy with this kid. He flies out of a. He gets thrown out of an airplane. He lands like a rock hits him on the head. When he gets up, it's just this kid can't catch a break. He gets thrown out of like three windows. And then he's at the last one and he's like, the guy, so the world needs to know. 
And then he's like, I'll show, show this boy the way out. He's like, that's okay. I know the way. And he just jumps out the door window because of the repeated joke of just the kid getting thrown out and the rules of threes, you know? Yeah. Perfect end of the joke. I, I thought it was exactly. And it, it didn't carry on, you know, those, those jokes don't carry on continuously throughout the films either, which is great because that, no. that's when you get, I think in my opinion, that's when you get, you've gone too far and you beat a joke to death. Right. Yeah. Especially with this adorable, leave it to beaver, ridiculous looking kid that everybody calls a troll and treats like he's a monster kind of talking about they, they figure out a plan, right? Ortiz, the dog boy chases a squirrel and everyone's left without a leader uh, later throughout the movie. And they're like, we don't know how to prevent the main villain or the secondary or tertiary villain, depending on whoever's watching this film. Cause you feel like EES is the bad guy. You get the feeling that uh, Randy Quaid's Elijah C. Skuggs character Mm -hmm. is the bad guy you just you're just not sure who the main bad guy is up until later on in the film anyhow uh with at, at the point like elijah c scuggs like essentially tells ricky coogan that he's going to turn him into a mindless freak that's going to murder all of his friends and he won't have any say about it because you know he's just perfect killing machine and he tells everybody that they make a plan and like this scene is kind of like slapstick comedy and he's about to say like to the plan he came up with which is to hire a bunch of sea monkeys or buy a bunch of sea monkeys and raise them up and give them guns so they can break out of there um that was a good plan by the way which i would have liked to see but instead like everybody keeps interrupting him with like oh you mean maybe we could turn you into a good monster with all the milk that comes out of cowboy you mean that milk that that I've been that I've been making based off of the vegetation I'm eating can actually be a counter agent to this chemical? And everybody just like creates this super mastermind plan to have worm climb underneath and create a tunnel and do all this crazy shit. And he's like, I mean, if you guys want to do that plan, I'm cool with that too. Yeah, it was it was good. It was a nice setup to trying to figure out what you know, what plan they're going to use. The fact that everyone chimes in with their own bit and piece. And even I think uh, Rosie, the pinhead screams out eventually, but she's a little lagged or delayed or whatever, which I thought was funny. They kept all the freaks kept to their parts, uh, but adding their piece, you know, worm, we could tunnel underground. Uh, and then, yeah, cowboy. Oh, you mean that green milk I've been shooting out of my udders is useful. <laughs> uh, and then you got, I don't know. Everyone has like their own little bit that they're building up. And then um, one of them looks at, yeah, looks at Coogan and was like, hey, I I just, you know, at first I really didn't like you, but now you, you've you come up with a really great idea. <laughs> and then he just admits to not actually coming up with the idea at all. Oh, it's so yeah. Good. No, they're like, how did you, how'd you do it? Well, I just wanted us to do this thing, but if you want to do that, that's cool too. Anyhow, let's kind of move on. All right. We have the big showdown at the end. The EES guys show up. They're they're like, we're going to shut you down, Elijah C. Skuggs, after the monster transformation. And there's a fight between Monster Stewie because a biker decided to dump the goop on him that they made for their plan. But their characters had eaten these magical macaroons that is going to revert them back into being normal people from being freaks because, you know, macaroons. Um, and everyone's like super happy. The ES guys become a giant shoe because everything except shoes, obviously, they got to turn into a shoe. And Elijah C. Scuggs turns into Brooke Shields. So uh, that's kind of the rushed ending to give to people. But that whole entire scene is a fucking riot. Like when the 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 evil corporate guys are like betraying Ricky, man. Like, or not Ricky, uh, Elijah C. Scuggs. What did you think was going to happen? Did you think, like, he was going to come back to them or they were going to win? You know, honestly, I I didn't care for the whole EES involvement at all. Uh, to me, the yeah. battle was always between Elijah C. Scuggs and the Freaks. And yeah. when they show back up and have that whole meeting and poor Stewie's going under the desk to, to rescue the, the the special gunk just for... Um, for Coogan, 
I, I mean, all that, like, it was funny. Don't get me wrong. All of it is funny. Yeah. But that, that's so, like, minor plot point-wise for me. That... It's like Saturday morning cartoon funny, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all this is. This whole movie is a Saturday morning cartoon that with real people in it. But I think the finale is really Coogan uh, and and Skuggs, you know, Randy Quaid's character and Alex Winter's character. That to me, that was the real finale. The whole yeah, shoe like, thing was just, yeah, it was just a little bit. That's all it was. Um, I feel like that him versus Skuggs was a bit too, because he just flies in and turns into Brooke Shields, and that's like it. He didn't stand a chance against him. But it's not it. Um, but yeah, they ate the macaroons and everybody but so frogman turns into a french guy who's just they don't really showcase him close up but you'll see like a frenchman all garbed up in like almost mime clothing hanging out with them so very french and uh everybody but the worm gets turned back to normal because he doesn't like macaroons just so random no like i'm not sure what the joke is there other than the fact that you know some people just don't like macaroons <laughs> no it's just he he was the only one that didn't have the antidote is the thing is like i hate macaroons so he's the character that wanted to turn back the most because he really wants to wipe his own ass i mean even the wrench got turned back into a or the hammer got turned back into a wrench man that's true like that the the hammer and the milkman costume was fucking great um now yeah, anyhow there there's a scene where where a wrench gets turned into a hammer and everybody cries up over it and they're saying that's the hardest story yet uh, anyhow man do you have like beyond that kind of getting the finale you see the movie end all the jump scares near the end what did you think man final thoughts i i like it i think it's a lot of fun i think uh you know this is something that i could definitely rewatch a couple times throughout the year if I if I was in a, a mood for something to just laugh my ass off to the entire time. Um, and it's one of those films that you're definitely not going to catch everything the first time you watch it. Um, for instance, I didn't catch the the hammer turning back into a wrench in a milkman oh, costume. So that was a... <laughs> it, it is in the milk milkman costume. I'm, I don't remember if the... I don't think the hammer actually turned back into the wrench. I think we forget about that later on. Oh. Maybe something happened to it and like cut cut pieces of the film. But after the milkman scene, we never see the hammer again. Speaking so. of which, like I wanna know what did get cut because a lot apparently a lot got cut from this film. And that you know, that's something that I would love to see in a, a restoration version, like a Scream Factory version, where they actually go through and they add in all the uh missing footage that was initially cut. If that ever can happen, that would be amazing. But I doubt it with this kind of a film. Um, just seems like this film's lost. Um, but, but anyways, my opinion, love it. I'd watch it multiple times throughout the year. I think it's a great movie. I, I appreciate you picking it because it's something that I probably wouldn't go out of my way to just go watch. Um, so to actually, you know, this is something I looked forward to watching that's been on the list for a while. So um, glad we could do it. Yeah, man. 10 out of 10. I love this film has a special place in my heart along with uh, Kung Pao and other, you know, easily movies that most people probably wouldn't like. Uh, but it fits my ADHD. It makes me feel like, I don't know, someone made a movie specifically for people like me. I just really appreciated it from there. Uh, yeah, I think that's all I really wanted to say, but there is a, there are a couple things kind of go over here. Um, there are some fun facts and trivia which I think we we went over quite a few of them. Um, yeah. But Curtis, did you know, question mark, that the legs of the actor playing the worm are visible in a few shots? No, I didn't. That's good. See? Uh, there's the scene where he offers the bag of macaroons so you can see his legs. Oh. Um, on the train, on the plane, when the troll gets knocked over, on the plane door and he f opens it and flies out you can see the white curtains uh used to appear as sky flapping <laughs> that's good uh yeah so when ricky leaves skug's den i remember when he's like trying to get the zygrot the special rub to turn him into a good monster to fight for them 
uh, he's walking on a dolly track, which you can see kind of at the end of the shot. Oh. So also, when the sock puppet's playing the bells at the talent show, he's not really playing them. They The bells ring before he even picks them up. <laughs> by the way, Rip sock, sock Boy, he died. He got shot by the Rastafari's. He did. Rip. Um. Kind of the worst with character, more holes and... I, I think I liked him the least, actually. I like Nosy more. I like Bobcat's voice. Uh, yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, Sock... He's a little bitch. <laughs> Sockhead's, yeah. Forgettable. A little bitch. Well, it's his fault. He had a nervous breakdown. Almost killed everyone. Uh, I, uh, I actually favorite... played in the handbell choir uh, back nice, in huh? uh, junior high. Nice. Yeah. I can relate I, to Sokka. Uh, <laughs> I just, you know, I, I just don't think you would lie about it, though. I think you would get good. I believe in you. So Ricky Coogan, uh, one of my favorite quotes of his was, I wonder if they're still casting Gremlins 3. That is a great quote. Yeah, especially since it never came out, so it's still relevant today. Yes. Uh, so Tom Stern also are in the movie again a second time. I uh, remember when they say, "If you're too sensitive, leave." Yes, they're the two oh yeah yeah go, yeah. Mm, and they look at each other and they just walk out. That is Alex Winter and Tom Stern. Yes, the creators of this film. I want to ask you a question. I... Yeah, what's the matter with all of you? You trust your lives to a guy just because he can lick his own balls? Come on, Curtis. You gotta admit he's a tall drink. I'm so disappointed that that quote didn't come up. Throughout our conversation, I completely missed my opportunity to do it. So I had to do it now. Yeah. Force feed it. No. Yeah. So also, Keanu Reeves, Alex Winter, William Sadler, Arturo Gill, Tom Stern, all of them appear in Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. Another great film. So just know that this movie is basically The Idiot Box. There's a homage to The Idiot Box if you've never seen it. Recommend watching the first episode. Um, the headache scene is probably my favorite skits that I've seen from that show. That's not saying much, but but it is really good. You know, it's really it's funny. pretty funny. Well, he goes goes from one saying he's like, "I'm in a lot of pain," and it's just the guy being in tons of pain, and then it bleeds into other scenes throughout the sketch comedy, like the flying gimp who dies at the beginning of Freaked. We never have to worry about him again. You know, the flying gimp tends to murder children. But anyhow, we're going to move on to talking about, Curtis, what have you been up to lately? So this week in Curtis land, I decided to take a trip down a um, a weird lane. I watched all of the Killjoy films from the Killjoy franchise. Um, if you don't know much about Killjoy... He is so so the first two films, Killjoy, Killjoy 2, start out as black exploitation. The first one, hundred percent, that's what it is. Um, it's an all black cast. Uh and and the story is is pretty pretty good. Uh it's pretty easy. Basically a young man gets picked on um and decides to use voodoo to bring this doll that he calls Killjoy to life. And uh unfortunately the the clown can't come to save him in time. Uh, the, the ritual just didn't work in time. And so the young boy ends up dying, but the clown does come back, uh, does come out and wreak havoc. Now, as we move along in this franchise, it goes further and further away from that initial film. Um, in, in the second one, uh, you still have an all, like a primarily all black cast and it's definitely a black exploitation film. Um, but it becomes less and less as the film goes on. And then by the time you get to three, it's completely different. It's it's now moved away from um, what it was trying to do in the first two films, but becomes a better production overall. Um, you could tell Full Moon put more money into it. Uh, Full Moon being the same people who created Puppet Master, in case you didn't know. Um, and yeah, so Killjoy 3 and 4, and then leading even into Psycho Circus. Uh, to me, just the production value just gets better. It just gets um, a lot better. We also get the addition of characters like Batty Boop, who I feel is um, 
a, a lot of fun to watch throughout those films. Now, these movies are not good movies. I do not want people to, you know, tweet at me or or email me or anything like that saying that I said these movies were amazing. I'm, I can enjoy the films uh, for what they are. And like Clark and I always talk about, I'm not a big, like, I'm not harsh on a lot of films. There, there is a very small bucket of movies that I absolutely hate or dislike. Um, these aren't in that bucket. Not, not one, not five, not any of the ones in between. Um, so if you, if you just want, if you got some time to kill, you know, check them out. They're, they're decent. They're a lot better than what I've seen, which isn't saying much, but, um, it's no infinite Santa 9,000. What are those movies called again? So you have, it's the Killjoy franchise. Yep. And it's uh, full moon entertainment. Um, so check it out if you've got some time. What have There's you been up to, Mina Fran? Uh, so, well, uh, we brought it, I brought it up already. Bill and Ted's excellent adventure, my friend. Uh, one of my favorite kind of '90s movies because I grew up in San Dimas, went to you know middle, middle school there, up to middle school, 13 years, kind of met a lot of friends, and just uh, we really loved that movie as a family. Watched a bunch, and George Carlin, the legend. Uh, paid homage to in this film just really good feelings all around uh <clears throat> this movie is uh if for anyone who's not seen bill and ted it's essentially two kind of idiot stoners are set to save the world with with music and uh unite the world they they create world peace uh somehow and the first two movies are them getting to that point the third movie is they never made the song that was supposed to unite the world. And they're now in their 40s or 50s, and they have to get their shit together. And their wives are almost going to divorce them. Um, and it's just these two lovable goofballs, like trying to figure out how they're going to save the world. They go to the future to steal this song from themselves. I just, without going into a review of this movie on its own, man, like it's super fun. Uh, I highly recommend it. If you want to watch a Bill and Ted movie and uh, fucking this is a Bill and Ted movie. Great way to end the, the trilogy. No more Bill and Ted movies. Good. Great. Otherwise, no, not much, man. I mean, that sounds like a lot. That's a, that's a brand new movie. That sounds awesome. Yeah. Um, like we talked about, I think you and I were chit chatting about this uh, yesterday. Yeah. Yesterday. Uh, I can't wait to see it. Um, I definitely want to do a marathon, though, where I watch the first two again because it has been some time bef- since I've seen the, the third one tonight. Yeah. I mean, I haven't watched them a lot, so I'd say I've probably watched the first two one time, you know. Uh, so so I definitely want to watch those again before I jump into the third one. But cool. Yeah. Glad to hear that you liked the movie. Yeah, dude. Of course I liked it. Um. I guess that's it. I guess it's time for us to really plug our media, digital media, our friendship times on the onlines. We have a Twitter and we have an Instagram and that Twitter and Instagram handle is two guys horror pod. The number two guys horror pod. Reach out to us. We do a lot of cool things here and there. Curtis likes to do live viewings on Twitter. Uh, We hang out a lot with the mutant fam reach out to us, hit us up there. Probably one of the places will be most responsive. Instagram, feel free to show us your cool pictures. Give us a follow. We'll follow you back. Uh, same with our, feel free to reach out with, to us via our email, which is the word to T-W-O, guys and some horror at gmail.com. Uh, otherwise, I think we're just kind of thinking of other cool things to kind of go through, do live viewings, live tweets. Curtis, you have other things you kind of want to talk about? I think you might. We have our YouTube channel, which has a ton of our episodes now. Um, By the time this episode actually airs, uh, we might even have all of season two up to date on the YouTube channel. So uh, we appreciate you guys coming, checking them out. Um, Don't forget to subscribe, like, leave a comment to let us know what your favorite part about the episode is. Um, and yeah, we, you know, we're going to continue to, to, to change up the show as, as, uh, as you, the listeners see fit for us to do that. So 
If in season three you want to see us doing more uh, video episodes and actually see our faces uh, as we're chit-chatting, let us know um, by subscribing, liking, um, and and we'll look to see how to set that up. Ring that bell, my friends. Thanks for checking out and hanging out with us. Be excellent to each other. See you guys. Bye. Twelve milkmen is theoretically possible. Thirteen is silly. Looks like there's one milkman too many, Coogan.